calling it a disease, see? And to give it that name, AIDS. So everything's included under that, and you don't have to just say, I mean, if you just said, you know, these people are getting a lot of weird diseases, all kinds of diseases, it wouldn't have had the same impact. It was much better to say, there is a infectious organism on the loose in America, and it could get you. I had interviewed the world's leading HIV experts and discovered that the two benchmark diseases of AIDS have alternate explanations. Once again, I turned to Dr. Gelderblom, seeking proof of HIV's existence in the most recent images available. Here, you do not see anything about uh, the details, but I would say it's probably a virus. These are HIV here? Yeah. Oh, the, so the, are the, these the, HIV too? Yeah, yeah. Everything's probably, probably. Probably. Yeah. What can I tell you? You know, I mean, it, it exists. <laughs> yeah, I said he had all these viruses, and it was a lie. I think HIV totally has turned out not to be the cause of AIDS. HIV has turned out not to be. Gelderblum's images, said to come from isolated HIV cultures, provided no proof for HIV's existence. So I asked Nobel laureate Dr. David Baltimore and Dr. Robin Weiss how they would isolate and photograph this elusive virus. Well, I, didn't Dr. Gallo do that? I mean, he actually isolated it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, why should I do all of this? This is all textbook stuff you're asking me. I'm not quite sure what's behind your question about isolation. I don't want to be your textbook, you know? Okay. I got other things to do. They're embarrassed. The scientists have been embarrassed about this. They know that it's flawed. In 1987, the CDC made two mind-boggling changes in the definition of AIDS, which are in effect today. You can be diagnosed with AIDS without ever having an HIV test. In 1987, I had a lesion on my arm, and it was KS, <clears throat> Kaposi sarcoma. The doctor diagnosed you with AIDS without an HIV test? Yeah. You can be diagnosed with AIDS if you've tested negative for HIV. Alvin Friedman Keen found 16 patients with Kaposi sarcoma among gay men in New York City in the 80s. They did not have HIV infection. Yet they had AIDS by our definition, right? In a World Health Organization publication, Dr. Chin writes, it should be emphasized that the surveillance definitions for AIDS were not intended to be reliable indicators of HIV infection. If you have thousands of documented cases of AIDS without HIV, how can HIV cause AIDS? Why do you believe that HIV does cause AIDS? Because that's all the information that I've been given. Because we've never been taught anything different. We have uh, read it, heard it. Because that's what the scientific community has told us. Scientists are supposed to observe, experiment, and reason from what they observe. They're not supposed to grab hold of an idea and cling to it and adjust everything else in their perceptions to fit that idea. I think an HIV positive test means that your life is forever changed. You have a whole new battery of things to consider for yourself. What does it mean to me? It's very um, hard to find anyone who supports you when you say, I don't think I'm going to die of HIV or AIDS. This, the typical model of HIV equals AIDS equals death, uh, how invested am I going to be in that model? Everyone who's infected with HIV would like to deny it. I mean, it's a bad prognosis. It means you're going to take drugs for the rest of your life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's people who want to say, ah, I'm one of the people who tested positive, but I'm not gonna get the disease. Do I start treatment? Treatment meaning the antiviral drugs, if ever? We started taking Lindsay to a doctor at the Children's Medical Clinic. She gave us a prescription for uh, retroviral syrup, which is AZT. It was so important for us to get something to help our baby that we sat on the floor in the pharmacy and gave her her first dose. 
Shortly after Lindsay began AZT treatment, side effects began to emerge. Her eating habits changed quite a bit. She didn't eat well. She was hard to handle at the table. And then the leg cramps started. Once that started, it got progressively worse. She would just grab him and go, oh, you know, screaming in the middle of the night. Just like it was a, it wasn't an ache, it was like, must have been sharp pains. It's just, just made you feel sick to your stomach. Any drug active on the HIV will be toxic because it's not 100% specific of the HIV enzymes. When we switched over to the university, then the dosage of AZT went up, and that's where she started flattening out on her uh, growth chart. The doctors would try to put a, a positive spin on how well she was progressing. It was, it was mainly in the T cells that weren't always a positive situation. Yeah, the T cell count would go down, and then the doctors would say, well, maybe we better raise that AZT dosage, get that T cell count back up. We were going, I think it's kind of making her sick because she doesn't want to eat. She's having leg cramps, and they'd say, well, it's the HIV, and that's what it does. It's all part of the package. The treatment causes uh, a very similar condition we would expect from an AIDS patient. That's why nobody noticed that there was something wrong with the treatment. I remember in 1992, after I first tested positive, I became involved in an organization called Women at Risk. There were 11 of us at the time on the board and involved in the group. All of us except three were on the medications. In the year and a half that I was involved with Women at Risk, every single woman in that organization on the drugs died. Every single one except the three of us who weren't taking them. We weren't just given handfuls of AZT, we demanded it. AZT should be free. Where is your humanity? We considered the FDA not giving us these things as being anti-gay instead of being responsible. And so we went and we lobbied and we pushed for all these things and we didn't think clearly about what it was we were asking for. It's like that saying, be, caref be careful what you ask for, it may come to pass. That's the very reason why everybody believed HIV is a deadly virus, because the HIV-positive patient at that time got a deadly treatment. Despite the billions spent on the drug, tens of thousands of people with AIDS have died. And now a growing number of studies are questioning the drug's usefulness. We just decided between ourselves in, um, in November to write to Peter Duisberg and say, sorry to bother you, are you for real? And if Lindsay were your daughter, what would you do? On November 11th, we got a big package and he said, you must take your daughter off AZT immediately or she will die from it like Kimberly Bagalis. That is AIDS by prescription. You get immunodeficiency and you die from the talks. That is AIDS by prescription. When AZT became widely available in, in 1985 and 1986, uh, I cautioned my patients not to jump on the bandwagon and start being treated. I didn't want to see my community poisoned by an ineffective therapy. I think in retrospect, the dose that we started with, with AZT, was uh, a dangerous and uh, poorly tolerated dose. Nobody wants to realize uh, what what was the real effect of this overtreatment? That means that we killed a whole generation of AIDS patients. 